And I believe that if senators strongly advocate and believe that judges should follow the law, not make it, should serve under the Constitution, not above it, who should be impartial and objective, if you believe in that, you should have very serious troubles with this nomination. And I'm just going to, at this moment, briefly mention a few of the serious concerns that were raised in the committee. One of the more serious issues that's been discussed quite a bit is the nominee's handling of the United States military while she was dean at Harvard. She reversed Harvard's policy, and she banned the military from the campus recruiting office. Uh, during that period of time, a protest against the military was held. Uh, she spoke to that protest crowd next door uh, in the building next door. A military recruiter was attempting to uh, recruit Harvard students for the United States military. The United States military did not have a policy um, called Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That was a law passed by the United States Congress and signed by President um, Clinton, and it was the law of the land, and it was not their choice. They followed, saluted, and did their duty. Yet, Ms. Kagan barred them from the campus at Harvard, and on four different occasions, this Congress passed laws to try to ensure that our military men and women at a time of two wars was not discriminated against on college campuses in this country. One of them was shortly before, a few months before, finally, we, it was written in a way they could not figure out a way to get around it. It was not justified. It was wrong. It should not have been done. She didn't seem to complain about the policy she, when she worked for President Clinton, who signed the law. But she punished the men and women who were preparing to serve and defend our country and Harvard's freedom to carry on whatever these silly activities they want to carry on. So this is not a little bitty matter. So when she came up for Solicitor General, this was raised. And she was asked, what if this don't ask, don't tell policy, law, uh, is challenged in the court. We know you oppose it. We know you uh, have said fastly opposed it. Uh, will you defend it? It's the law of the land. You will be Solicitor General. You represent the United States uh, government in court before the Supreme Court. Uh, will you defend it? And she uh, flat out said that she will defend the laws of Congress and specifically promised to defend Don't Ask, Don't Tell. What did Elena Kagan do? Did she vigorously defend the law? Did she take the opportunity to take this case to the Supreme Court uh, and seek its affirmation by the Supreme Court? No, she allowed the case to be sent back without appealing it to a lower court to go through a long, prolonged uh, process of uh, discovery and trial uh, that is disconnected to the plain fact of the legality or not of the policy. And, and it, was, it was not properly defending the laws of the United States and not defending this matter. And our Solicitor General has that duty. They just have that duty, whether they like the law or not. It's congressional actions. Congressional actions, when challenged, uh, should be defended, particularly one so easily defended, in my opinion, is this one. So I believe that's a serious matter, uh, so serious that if my analysis is correct, that she failed to defend that action after explicitly having promised to do so, then this is disqualifying in itself. As Solicitor General, in this 14 months that she was there, she approved the filing of a brief calling on the Supreme Court to uh, review and overturn a ruling by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that had affirmed an Arizona law that said 
Arizona businesses who fail to use E-Verify or otherwise hire people that are illegally in the country lose their business license. I think this was bad judgment legally, and I believe it's an example again of our personal policy views influencing the uh, decision she made as a government official. Not the kind of thing you want in a Supreme Court justice. And then there was a time she served as the in the Clinton White House and became involved in the great debate we had in the Senate that went on for a period of years over the partial birth abortion issue, where, where, where uh, uh, unborn babies are partially removed from the mother and, and they're, uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, their techniques are used to remove the child's uh, brain and, 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 uh, and then it's removed from the mother. Uh, and it's a horrible procedure. And the gynecologist group, the ACOG group, had issued an, a finding that uh, there was never any medical necessity for this horrible procedure that Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan referred to as so terribly close to infanticide. And President Clinton apparently uh, was prepared to, to uh, go along with the banning this procedure. And she uh, uh, got uh, active and as a member of his staff. And she uh, advised that it might be unconstitutional. Uh, she said the groups, that is the pro-abortion groups, these are notes from the White House documents, the groups will go crazy. She called the uh, uh, ACOG, the gynecologist group, and she... Uh, uh, talked to them about the statement that they'd issued. She got them to issue a new statement. She was right at the center of that, and she apparently called people over there at the top of the group, and they changed the wording without talking to the professional committee and that had issued the original analysis. There was never any need for this kind of procedure to take place. And with regard to the Second Amendment, her actions both as a law clerk and the Clinton White House uh, uh, indicate that she has a hostile view to gun ownership. She grew up in Upper West Side of New York, and uh, uh, it's pretty clear that she's one of the groups that sees the NRA as a bad group and who does not believe in gun ownership as a constitutional right in America. Uh, the progressives saw the Constitution as an impediment, not as a protector of our liberties, of our freedom, of our prosperity, of our property, not the Constitution. That's, and they saw it as an impediment to uh, getting done what they like to, done, to do. And that is an un, a dangerous philosophy, I think. Because ultimately, all our liberties depend on the faithful adherence to the Constitution, the free speech, free press, the right to a trial by jury, all those things that are so important to our rights are in that document. So I think that this nominee is indeed of that background, that she's not sufficiently respectful of the plain words of the Constitution, will be the kind of activist judge that seeks to advance their vision of what America should be, and that that is not an appropriate uh, approach for a judge on the Supreme Court to take. Well, I'm excited, too. <laughs> of the many responsibilities granted to a president by our Constitution, few are more serious or more consequential than selecting a Supreme Court justice. The members of our highest court are granted life tenure, often serving long after the presidents who appointed them. And they are charged with the vital task of applying principles put to paper more than 20 centuries ago. It's not about justice. It's not about agenda. It's not about mobilizing people. It's about dialing for corporate dollars. These two parties have sold the U.S. government and the American people to the highest bidders.